right, so we're coming back to part two of our algebraic methods notes, and now we're going to be dealing with the trig. Now, we had discussed in a previous uh, section of notes that there were basically two limit properties that you needed to memorize. The first one was that if I was going to take the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x, that that limit would always be equal to 1. And then you were also supposed to memorize the limit as x approaches 0. All right, let me make sure I was headed to the right place. Of 1 minus cosine of x over x is equal to 0. So those are the two basic ones that we started with. And then I did several examples where we kind of bumped it up a little bit where we added a constant in here and over here, and that it, it has the same limit. So that's this first one down here that you're going to memorize. Now, I've also have several other ones, because there's really no point in AP. You're going to see this mostly in the multiple choice section, that you're not going to have to prove these. You might as well just memorize these alternate forms of these two basic limits. So anytime you have mx, any constant times x, as long as it matches from here in both of these locations, that limit's going to be 1 as well. That if I take the reciprocal of it, the limit is going to be 0. And then also if I have a tangent instead of a sine in there, that's also going to be equal to 1. And I'll actually prove one of these for you down below uh, just to show you. And then from now on, just pretty much memorize all of these forms. Likewise, here are other alternate forms that you want to memorize. Here is an extension of this one where you have two signs in it. And again, I'll do a proof for one or two of these in here to kind of show you that all of these are going to be m over n. Here's the cosecant and cotangent version. So basically 2 and 3 are kind of very similar to each other. And that's n over m. And that kind of should make sense. If you think sine and sine, what's the cosecant's relationship? It's the reciprocal. So it would be the reciprocal. And then here's the version of number 2 that you had up here with the constant added in. And then notice that I've also done this where I basically switched it as well. And the reason that you can switch this, it should be common sense, is that, hey, when you multiply maybe the top and the bottom by negative 1, a number at the bottom being negative doesn't change the fact that the top goes to 0. You still get 0. 0 over negative is 0. 0 over positive is 0. So they would all be the same. So we're going to do a couple proofs of these. but. Pretty much after this set of notes, you're just going to memorize these. And whenever you see these forms, then you know the limits are either going to be 1, m over n, n over m, or 0. So we'll add these to our kind of special limits. All right, so here's the variation up there in number 1 where it has a tangent instead of a sign. So let's see kind of how we deal with this. The idea is, is that I'm going to use a trig identity. So I'm going to do the limit as x approaches 0 of mx. And I'm going to remember that from trig, tangent is really sine divided by cosine. So this is going to become sine of mx divided by cosine of mx. And then I remember my algebra rules, which says dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So the limit as x approaches 0 of mx on the top. And then if I flip and multiply, I would end up with a cosine of mx. And then on the bottom, I have a sine of mx. And then I'm going to remember that I can group these kind of as I wish. So this is going to become the limit as x approaches 0 of the mx over sine of mx. So I'm getting it into a form that I already know, times the cosine of mx. Now, the reason I split this up into a product is if you'll recall our properties of limits, as long as the limits exist, the limits of a product are the product of the limits. So I can take this product and change it into the limit as x approaches 0 of the first part, sine of mx, times the limit as x approaches 0 of the second part. Now, how did I know that the limit existed for both of the items that I was multiplying together? That's a special form, which we know is 1. This right here, cosine, 
continuous function, you can use direct substitution. I can plug in the zero and simply do the cosine of m times zero. That's the cosine of zero, which is one, one times one is one. So there's a little proof for the tangent that it's really based on the fact that I have sine over cosine and I can flip and manipulate it. Okay, likewise, let's take a look at this one. Same kind of idea. This is from the second set up there. That having a tangent over a sine is going to give me m over n. Now, you know, I might want to back up and kind of remind you why this one ends up being your um, m over n to start with. Maybe I should have put that in the notes, but we'll do it right here. If I want to take the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of mx divided by sine of nx, I'm going to split this like this. 1 over sine of nx, kind of starting it in that fashion to kind of show you what we're doing there. And remember that you can add a form of 1, and it doesn't change the function that we're dealing with here. So what I'm going to add in here okay, is I'm going to add in a form of 1. I'm going to multiply by uh, on the bottom, because uh, I want an mx here. Then it would be in the right form. So I'm going to put an m, actually... I just, let's just do with the x first. I need an x here, and I need an x there. I'll worry about the constant in just a second. So I'm really going to multiply by x over x. And when you're multiplying, remember, it doesn't matter what order you multiply. So I can take this denominator x and just basically move it there, and this numerator x and move it there. So that's going to give me, in this first example, the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of mx over x times x over sine of nx. So I'm getting closer to the form. Now what I'm missing is an m and an n. And remember, you're only allowed to put in forms of 1. So what I'm going to do here is go, well, I want an m here. So I'm going to do m over m for this one. And then for this one, I need an n. So I'm going to do n over n. I'm putting in forms of 1. Now what that basically does for us is now I'm going to have the limit as x goes to 0 of m sine of mx over mx times nx over sine of nx times 1 over n, that one that's left right there. And I have the limit of a product, which is the product of the limits. Okay, I'll skip a little step, I'm not really doing a formal proof here. The limit as x approaches 0 of m, which is a constant, would simply be, what's the limit of a constant? The constant. The limit as x goes to 0 of sine of mx over mx is 1. Okay, that's that one. Times the limit as x goes to 0 of nx over sine of nx. That's essentially this one. doesn't really matter if I call it m or n. It's still the same. So that's 1. And the limit of 1 over n, constant, is 1 over n, which is m over n. So that's kind of a little shortcut of proving where this number 2 comes from. Now I'll come down here and do a little bit more complicated one, tangent over sine. So we have the limit as x goes to 0. And I'm going to do what I did up here. I'm going to take the tangent out, and I'm going to put sine over cosine. Now be very careful with your m's and n's, because you don't want to get them mixed up. So I have sine over cosine, and then that's all divided by sine of nx. Then I'm going to rearrange this, limit as x goes to 0. Dividing by sine, that's like sine over 1, is multiplying by the reciprocal, and I can regroup as sine of mx over sine of nx, bringing this up to the top, and then times 1 over cosine of mx. And take a moment, play around with your fractions, and make sure you understand how that works. And then this is the one I just proved up there. The limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of m over the sine of n is m over n. The limit exists for this one, because the cosine of 0 is not 0, so the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And 
And then basically all we have to do is we know that the first limit is m over n. The second limit, I can just plug it in, is 1 over cosine of 0, which is 1. So I get m over n again. Okay. And then the last one, I'm going to leave this one for you to do. But the idea is, what do we know cosecant is? Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. So I will leave that for you to do, and we'll discuss that in class next time. Okay. All right, so now we move on to the examples here for this one. Now, since I've already done an example similar to A, I'm going to leave this one for you to try on your own. Okay, and then we'll discuss it in class next time. Uh, let's come down here to example B, and that's kind of where we'll start this set of notes. All right, so here in this example, we notice that we have the secant 2 theta minus 1. Now, we might initially take a look at this and be like, wait a minute. We have the cosine. If I had a cosine minus 1, that would be a lot better, or maybe a 1 minus a cosine. And I remember from trig that the secant is the same as 1 over cosine. So I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to substitute in the limit as theta goes to 0. And instead of secant, I'm going to do 1 over cosine of 2 theta minus 1, and then theta times 1 over cosine of 2 theta. And then I get that complex fraction. So now I'm going to use the technique that we talked about a little bit earlier. It doesn't have to just be with algebra. It can be with trig as well, where I have a complex fraction situation where I have fractions and fractions. So I'm going to multiply by the form of 1. That is my, the only denominator I had, which is cosine of 2 theta. Since this is minus, I'm going to remember to distribute through the addition subtraction. And then down here at the bottom, it's all multiplication. So I'm, remember, you don't distribute over multiplication. So I'm just going to multiply these two together. So that's going to give me the limit as theta goes to 0. This is going to become 1 minus cosine of 2 theta over theta. Now I'm really, really close to the form that I need. What am I missing? I'm missing the 2 that I need here. Remember we said we could start doing the shortcut. If I put in a 2 here, I need to put a 2 out here so I have that form of 1 to cancel it out. And I know that this would be 2 times the limit of the special form, which is 0. 2 times 0 is 0. And then we're done. Right. Let's see. I'm going to leave this one for you to do on your own, because it's very similar to what I did up there. My hint to you would be think about what secant is the same as. So I'm going to leave this for you to do on your own, and we'll come back together and look at that at class next time. Uh, this one right here, there's really nothing to this one because this is directly one of the forms that I'm asking you to memorize. Look in uh, number two in the list, the third one over, tangent over a sine, limit as x goes to zero, and that's the m over n, and so m is five, n is seven, and we're done. So we just simply move on with that. Let's take a look at the next set. All right, with here, let's talk about some strategies with this. Notice that I have a sine squared, and this is going to require you to recall that you have the limit as t goes to 0, that this is the same as saying sine of 2t times sine of 2t. That's what we mean when we say we square the sine. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have this 3, and then I'm going to do times t times t. So what I can basically do in this problem and hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going with that. I'm going to have the one-third, which is the constant, times sine of 2t over t times sine of 2t over t. See, I'm trying to get those forms in there that we know. Now what I see is that what I'm missing here is I'm missing, I need a 2 here, and I need a 2 here as well. Now that would give me a total of 4 in the denominator, so I'm going to add that 4 up there, because i got to do by a form of 1. So I'm essentially 
taking what's here and I'm multiplying by 4 over 4 so that and then splitting them up nicely so that they work out. I bring this 4 out and then I have the 2 and the 2. All right? The limit of a constant, the constant or scalar multiple times anything, you can basically pull that out. So that's going to be 4 thirds. Then the limit as t goes to 0 for this will be 1. The limit as t goes to 0 for that will be 1. And my final answer, 4 thirds. Okay, so that shows you a little bit with that example. All right, let's take a look here at f. Right, actually, before we take a look at F, I do want to kind of go back for a second. I've been kind of glossing over one little fact that you probably should be checking as you go. I mean, I get to that point where because I, I know that this is going to happen, I don't always say that I did it, but I'm doing it in my head. So I just wanted to come back and say I am checking to make sure that I have this indeterminate form. That I am initially starting this with the direct substitution, and I am plugging in the zero. So I have sine squared of essentially zero over zero, sine of zero is zero, zero squared is zero, it is giving me the zero over zero. So that's how I know that I'm looking for this special strategy of using these special limits in order to calculate it. Uh, likewise, if we come back, uh, this one's easy, tangent of zero over zero, tangent of zero is zero over zero in determinate form. And you do want to do that because some of these, they might trick you and give you something that you can actually just use direct substitution on. So you do want to check and make sure that you do have a problem. Here you would have secant of 0 minus 1 over 0 times secant of 0. Uh, secant of 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so reciprocal of 1 is 1. So we end up with 1 minus 1 over 0 times 1 or 0 over 0. So these are giving you the indeterminate form. I'm not going to go back and do all of them. You had to do C anyway. So make sure you show me that you get the indeterminate form for C. And make sure that, like again, tangent of 0 over sine of 0, that's clear that you would get your 0 over 0 form. So I, I wasn't saying that as I was going along, but you really should be checking that because you should go, hey, direct substitution number one strategy. See if you got a vertical asymptote number two, number over 0. And then the 0 over 0 case, which is where we have to do all this work. All right? So let's come back down here to F. And let's check that we've got 0 over 0. So we have 1 minus tangent of pi over 4, which is 1 minus 1, or 0. And then we have sine of pi over 4 minus cosine of pi over 4. Square root of 2 over 2 minus square root of 2 over 2, which is 0. So again, you know, it's one of those things that if I'm in this section, you can probably guess that I'm giving you a 0 over 0. But I figured I would go back and say you really should be doing that as your first step when you do these problems. All right, now let's take a look at this one. And, you know, this one might be initially be a little bit hard to look at because you're like, what am I going to do? I, I would start with this tangent and change it to sine over cosine. because That's always a good strategy to try. Uh, is one of the easier trig substitutions. So I'm going to do is x goes to pi over 4, 1 minus sine of x over cosine of x divided by sine of x minus cosine of x. And then I get those complex fractions. So I go back to the strategy, which says that I want to multiply by a form of 1, which is the LCM, and the only denominator I have is cosine. So I'm going to try cosine of x cosine of x. Okay, and multiplying that inside the limit here when we look at it. Now when I do that and I distribute through the top, so I'm going to multiply through the top, gives me the limit as x approaches pi over 4 of cosine of x, cosine times 1, and then cosine times sine over cosine would give me minus sine of x. And then remember the offending factor, the bad guy factor, is this sine x minus cosine x. Don't multiply the denominator through, because remember you're trying to get rid of this denominator. So the offending factor, you don't want to multiply it through. And then I look at what I have, and I think, well, did I do something that helped me? And then I say, wait a minute, notice the numerator factor and the denominator factor, they're really, really close, they're just opposite of each other. So I can factor out a negative 1 out of the top, 
And if I take a negative 1 out of the top, then these would be the opposite, and I can reverse them. So it would become sine of x minus cosine of x in the top. And in the bottom, I have the sine of x minus cosine of x times cosine of x. You can extend that out if you would like. Now I can remove the bad guy factor. Go away. What I have left, remember I still haven't taken the limit. I know it's tedious, but keep writing it. And on the top now I have a negative 1 left. And in the bottom I have cosine of x. And I've got to remove the bad guy factor. So I can now just do direct substitution. Negative 1 over cosine of pi over 4 is going to be negative 1 over 1 over root 2, or you could do square root of 2 over 2, it doesn't matter which form, which simplifies to negative square root of 2. Okay? So that one was a little bit trickier, but it was the same kind of idea. Use a trig substitution, complex fraction, multiply by a nice form of 1, and then you'll be able to work with the problem. Alright, let's take a look at G here. We have basically two more things to do in this set of notes. So in G, as we take a look at that one, we say, wait a minute, what in the world am I going to do here? What you should notice is that this is, it's not a polynomial over a polynomial, it's what we like to call a pseudo polynomial. This is a polynomial in cosine of x. This is a quadratic where you can think of your variable as cosine of x. And we did some factoring with this last year in pre-calculus. So we're going to take the limit as x goes to pi over 3. And again, you should get in the habit of this. You technically should check what happens when I do pi over 3. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Squared is 1 fourth times 12 is going to give me 3. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half times 2 plus 1 minus 4. There's my 0 in the top. And then 4 times... My 1 half minus 2 gives me the 0 in the bottom, so it is 0 over 0. All right. So I'm going to factor this. First thing you notice, GCF. All of these are divisible by 2, so I'm going to pull the 2 out. That leaves me with 6 cosine squared x plus cosine of x minus 2. I'm going to pull the GCF out of the bottom. 2. 2 cosine x minus 1. So those are going to cross out. Now, the really the bad guy factor is this 2 cosine x minus 1. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, that must be a factor up here. So if that helps you see the factoring, that's always kind of, there's always hints in these problems, when you're, especially when you're factoring. So I'm going to play around with this, do a little bit of guess and check. If I do 2 cosine x minus 1, the first term here, in order to get 6 cosine squared, would have to be 3 cosine x, and then in order to get a minus 2, this would have to be a plus 2. And then double check your middle terms. This is minus 3 plus 4 of the cosines. It gives me the cosine, so that works out. 2 cosine x minus 1. Now I can remove the bad guy factor. I'm left with finding the limit as x approaches pi over 3 of 3 cosine x plus 2. Since the bad guy factor is gone, I can now do a direct substitution. 3 cosine of pi over 3 plus 2. 3 times a half plus 2. So 1 and a half plus 2 and a half is 3 and a half. <coughs> Although technically I don't really like writing mixed fractions, so write it as 7 halves so that we're clear. Because Really, you can see the confusing notation. 3 times a half looks very similar to 3 and a half. And so usually it's better to go ahead and write your answer like this so there's no confusion. All right? So again, the strategy was very similar to what we had before. Even though it had trig in it, it really was a polynomial in trig that you could factor and then cancel the common factor. Very similar to what we did before. And then just to finish out these notes, there's one more special limit that you should memorize. It's not as common as the trig ones, but you do want to make sure you take a look. And this is actually just straight from your definition of what actually E is. If you look back at your notes from pre-calculus on continuous compounding, this was probably discussed at some point. So we're doing the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 
plus x over 1 over x, and that does happen to have a limit that is e. So you do want to memorize this. You won't see it as much, but they surprise you every now and then. They throw it in. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. So it's not really any algebra to do this when you just have to memorize it. So add that to your list to memorize. And then we'll set stop with those notes, and we'll come into class next time. We'll process the ones that I've asked you to do, and then we will um, do some practice problems.